And the, really, the framework you got to treat this with is first make it work and then make it fast. Don't try and do everything at once. Start out slow, make it slow, then improve it. <laughs>
None of these apps needed to do that. They are totally superfluous, delightful little touches, but they make the app have so much character. Apps like these will be remembered fondly for years to come. And this is why I keep coming back to vinyl, because vinyl records started out as something that was basically functional. Like it played music, but it wasn't that great. It was evolved into something that was even better. And then eventually, nowadays, they are so delightful for some people that people will choose to use them instead of Spotify or Apple Music or CDs or even cassette tapes. I'm one of those people. Uh, I have a lot of fun listening to vinyl records. And so I made an app to try and reminisce and bring some of that delight in listening to vinyl records to iOS. Albums. It's a free app, totally on the App Store. I built it literally just for myself because I wanted to have albums on my home screen. Uh, you can develop your own like digital collection of records. Uh, instead of making playlists or collecting artists, you literally just listen to the albums beginning to end. Um, and it's just really fun. And I really wanted to walk through today some of the challenges and solutions and iterations I made to make this app as delightful as it can be while staying focused with that original intent. So for our outline, first we're going to start with building a stable foundation. Second, we're going to work to improve our interactions and responsiveness of the app overall. And lastly, we're going to work on making it memorable. So building a stable foundation, what does that mean? Well, in order to build a great app, you first need to build a good app. It really needs to just work. Without a stable baseline, any efforts you make to make it feel delightful will literally just go to waste because people will be frustrated and it doesn't matter how fun your app is to use, if it doesn't work, not that useful. And really, the framework you got to treat this with is first make it work and then make it fast. Don't try and do everything at once. Start out slow, make it slow, then improve it. And now you may be saying, well, how can I start? There's just way too many technologies to build with on iOS nowadays. You know, we've got Swift UI, we've got UIKit, MVVM, MVC, TCA, CAT. You know, we've got Core Data, we got Realm. Uh, there's now ChatGPT and Big Data and all this other stuff, and you just end up paralyzed with so many choices because you don't know what to do. And the solution for choice paralysis is really just picking something and running with it. It's the best way to try things and learn from them and develop an informed opinion on how they work. You spend less time researching and more time trying and seeing what works for you. And even if it falls, at least you now have the experience going forward being like, I've used that before, it's not that great or I've used that, we should use it again. It's fantastic. And so here's some of the technical choices that I picked for albums. Um, because it's a widget generator on iOS, we have to use WidgetKit, which is all based on Swift UI. But I also really like working with UIKit, especially for gestures, so we're gonna use those two interchangeably. I also wanted easy sync between devices, so we're using Core, Kit, or Core Data and CloudKit. And we'll also be downloading some artwork from the network, so I figured this was a great opportunity to put async and await to work for us. So starting off, here's our basic album art view. It's very simple, it's an image, we make it resizable so it can stretch and contract. Uh, we're also applying a mask to it to give it some nice rounded corners. And lastly, we're adding a shadow to give it some depth on the screen. 
Now, we have a collection of albums that we need to show, so we're probably going to use a collection view, which makes sense, and we'll use a diffable data source as a great modern means to manage our data that we have stored. Now, for making a scrolling collection of these albums, like, what would we do for the items? Like, we could do an album collection view cell of some kind, but I don't really want to duplicate the code that we wrote for our Swift UI view. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I rewrite something in UIKit that we already have working in Swift UI? And you know, if only there was a way to just wrap that Swift UI view into a collection view cell. Well, it turns out Apple thought of this, and they actually have docs on this, which is wonderful. Uh, UI hosting configuration is a content configuration suitable for hosting a hierarchy of Swift UI views. So basically, you give it a Swift UI view, and it'll render that automatically inside of your collection view cell. And it was at this point where I had this massive brain breakthrough where I was like, wait, I'm making widgets in Swift UI. I can just display the widgets in the app. And that made the architecture of it like literally a line of code. It was so simple. Uh, and this is what we're just gonna roll with for everything else. Because now we have like this album model, which is like the title and the artist, and we can use it for everything in the app. We'll use the same views for the widget, the same views in the collection view, same views for previews, literally anywhere. It's very easy to maintain and improve. So I went and did some work, and I added them into a list, and we had it importing support, and you can add them, there's some settings, but you can see it kind of hitches when you're scrolling. Like, it'll freeze up and stutter a lot, which is weird because they're just a bunch of Swift UI views. What could be happening here? And so Xcode has this really cool tool that you can look at view hierarchies to sort of help us and understand what's going on here. So if you click this little, like, rectangular thing down here, it'll bring you to the view debugger. And a common hidden feature is the show layers feature of the editor, so we're gonna turn that on to see what's happening with our layers. And you're gonna see as soon as we do that, we now have this purple flag that's yelling at us and saying like, hey, you have six runtime issues you gotta fix. And if we look at it, it's gonna point to one of our CA layers and say like, hey, there's a problem with this layer, you should really look at it. And so we'll look at it and it's saying, oh, this layer is using dynamic shadows, but there's no shadow path applied. That's really bad. And Sure enough, if you look at the inspector, you'll see we're doing four off-screen passes here just to render an image and a shadow. And that's where we get to off-screen rendering. Because shadows and masking are actually very expensive to do on iOS. Even on our super fast devices, if left unchecked, they will bring your app down. Off-screen passes are when the GPU has to do a bunch of work off-screen and then bring it on-screen when it's ready to do so. However, if it's doing this on the main thread, that's gonna cause a hitch, especially on devices that run at 120 hertz. That's a really short time window to get all those off-screen passes done. So we're gonna try and fix that. And when you look at the code, you know, you realize that sometimes Swift UI views just get really confused about the shadow types that we're supplying here. Because we're supplying some arbitrary mask that doesn't really know what it is, and so it doesn't really know how to actually optimize that shadow for the mask. And so following what it said in instruments, or Xcode, we could just supply a shadow path here, right? Well, no, we can't, because that API doesn't actually exist yet, and we're kind of screwed. There's, there's not really anything we can do. Um, we can try and clip the shape instead of masking in the hope that that would actually fix things, uh, but when we look at it, it actually makes it worse. Now we have six off-screen passes, which is like, again, not helping us here. And after some experimentation, I found out that if you just take a shape, a simple little shape, and you apply a shadow to that, and then add that as a background to your view, that makes zero off-screen passes. It's very simple. You should definitely try in everything you're doing. And of course, we'll apply that here, and you'll see that scrolling is buttery smooth, uh, super fast, super efficient, and like a super easy fix to gain tons of frame, uh, FPS. So some more pro tips. First off, again, verify that your shadows and masking, especially in Swift UI, are optimized. Sometimes it fails to do that correctly. So again, check for off-screen passes in the view debugger. Supply shadow path for CA layers where you're doing this manually, but for Swift UI views, again, use a simple shape, use a shadow on that shape, and then use that as your background to optimize that. Lastly, just try it in your current projects today. I guarantee you will find like free wins from that. Second, another thing I had to do was all of these album art images, a lot of them coming from iTunes are like 600 by 600 pixels. And so if we're doing that for every single one of these, that's a lot of VRAM. So we need to make sure that we're actually asynchronously decoding those on the GPU in the background so we're not hitching when we're loading those in. 
Also, just avoid resizing cells by any means possible. In my case, I, I preemptively pick a size for those cells to render so that the collection view layout doesn't have to actually figure out what it's supposed to do for each individual cell. Um, and always just load data and assets on, off the main thread. You would be surprised how much they actually can cause locks or other issues that will cause micro stutters. So, recapping. We made sure that our collection view scrolls smoothly, just to start. Album views are now quick to render, so we can use them wherever we want. And lastly, we started with something that worked and then made it fast. So, on to the next part. Improving interactions and responsiveness. This is where things get a little bit more involved. So with iOS, apps feeling responsive is really important. You can immediately tell when an app is not feeling responsive. It's ignoring your touches, it just doesn't feel that great. But once you have a good baseline for your app architecturally, you can start optimizing that responsiveness and moving forward with it. Navigation is usually a really great place to start for that. So let's take this for an example. I went and made a simple editor that allowed you to change properties of your albums and it's pushed on a navigation controller. You know, this works, it's totally delightful, you have some nice controls, but we can really do better. Like, this is a lot of a heavy lift for pushing an entirely new screen just to edit something that's really small on the screen. We really should be interacting with that content. And so for inspiration from this, I actually drew from the real world. Uh, anytime I pick up a record and play from it, I check the back to see what's on the other sides of the records because there's only so many songs that each side of those records that they can hold. Um, since this field kind of like similar to me, I was looking around iOS and I realized that like, oh wait, iOS uses this as well. In fact, it uses it for widgets. When you edit a widget, it flips it over and you have a bunch of configuration problem or options on one side of the widget and then it flips back down to the home screen so it goes back into place. Uh, and we can borrow from this because this is giving people a familiar interaction so that it's not like alien to them when they come to our app and they start using it. If we have an app where you're configuring widgets, why not configure widgets in the app like you would do in Springboard? This is a lot more lightweight of an experience. So how would we make this album flip? So we'd have two views. We'd have the front, which is the album, and then we'd have the back, which is the widget preview or the editor. So what you're editing, so when it flips over, you see the back side, when it goes back, you have the front side. We need some sort of coordinator or manager to handle the animations, and we need to have interruptible animations to make sure that it's actually responsive. We need to do some math, and we need an animation library. And we're gonna go back to this animation library that I created called Motion. And this is designed basically for building interactions like this, highly custom, highly gestural. What's fun is I actually use Motion to generate the logo for Motion. Uh, that was a fun experiment. And so like I said, Motion is an animation engine I wrote for building gesturally dri driven user interfaces, animations, and interactions. It does all of these animations in process. So think like UI scroll view. Again, you're contending with the same sort of issues where uh, hitching is an issue and you need to be careful with it. But it does allow for creating easily interruptible animations that just feel really great. There's springs, there's decays. This really aids in making a responsive application. It's not a replacement for core animation though, because again, performance is at the whim here. However, it is excellent for these sort of interactions where you can control the entire stack and make sure it's good. So here's sort of what we're looking at here. We have this double-sided hosting controller. And what we're gonna start off is we're gonna have a front hosting controller and a back hosting controller. So both of those are gonna host Swift UI views, but we're gonna handle the layout of it manually. So when we load the view, we're actually gonna do something custom. First off, we're gonna make sure that the background is clear, so we don't have anything rendering from the view controller that we have. Then we're gonna add the back hosting controller first. It's gonna be at the bottom. Then we're gonna add the top hosting controller on top of that, and then we're gonna set up the initial rotation state. And this is where the magic happens. So whenever you tell this double-sided hosting controller to rotate, you're passing in radians, and so it's gonna rotate pi or two pi or whatever, but you're gonna supply a back angle for the underside of it. So it's always gonna do the opposite of what the front side is doing. So if you say for this whole view to flip like 180 degrees, the back side is gonna flip negative 180 degrees. And when we apply that, we're gonna make sure that we use CA disable actions to make sure that no core animation animations happen during the setting of that transform. Now, when we initialize this double-sided hosting controller, it's really simple from the implementation side because again, I'm just passing in the album art view and we're disabling the safe area because we don't want the animations to get weird and messed up with those guys. Um, and then the back side is gonna be the preview version of that. So again, it's gonna host the front and then the back. 
Then for our animator, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a spring animation. And we're going to set a response time of about half a second. And we're going to make sure the damping is 1.0. That means that it's not going to spring around. It's just going to move nicely to the end state. We're going to, again, give it our double-sided hosting controller to animate. And anytime we get a rotation animation tick, so anytime the animation changes, we're going to apply that rotation to our double-sided hosting controller. So, so to present it, what we're going to do is we're going to flip the record over when it comes up. So we're passing in pi, so it flips over. And when we dismiss it, we're going to do the opposite and set it back to zero. And when you put that all together, this is what it looks like. It will flip over. And what the neat part is core animation, by default, has double-sided rendering off. So actually, when you flip it over, the backside automatically hides for you. You don't have to do weird things with hiding or alpha changing or any of that sort of stuff. If you just configure the layers correctly and you apply the transforms correctly, it does all that work for you. And we don't want that record to sort of open in place, because that doesn't make much sense. So we're going to change the animation to also center it in the screen. So we're going to do a separate animator that's going to run at the exact same time. This is going to be the position animation. So we're going to tell that position to move to the center of the screen, and this is going to run at the exact same time that the record flips over. And now you might be saying, well, why can't we just use a frame? That seems so much easier. Just move it to the center of the screen. Well, setting the frame actually overrides the position, bounds, and transform. It resets all of those. So A, it's really bad for our animation, because if we're relying on the transforms to stay consistent, it's going to break that. But also, setting the frame will cause the entire view hierarchy to re-render for the view that we're setting the frame on. So in this case, it would be rendering not only the front of the record, but the backside as well, every single frame. And that can be expensive. Imagine how slow like Touch's move would be on something if we were reflowing text every single frame. It would just stutter and fail so easily. So using position or transform instead of frame is actually way, way, way more efficient because you're avoiding those layout passes. So again, avoid setting the origin on a frame or any sort of frame because setting that will invalidate the layout. But if you set the transform or the position manually, in this case, we're setting it uh, to the min, uh, mid x and mid y of the bounds of the view that's holding this every frame, it will be much, much, much more performant. And so again, we put all those together, and it feels a lot more natural. You'll see that as we flip it up, the back side will disappear, or will appear, and the front side will disappear automatically for us. But this still looks kind of weird, because it looks like it's kind of like stretching and squashing to open up. It doesn't really look 3D. It doesn't have any sort of weight to it. And that's because we're missing perspective. Uh, it's missing this sort of like 3D effect. And if you've ever seen tutorials online mentioning an M34 on a CA transform and have no idea what that means, we're going to explain that. This is called the perspective transform. And it's what gives a lot of animations a lot of depth. Uh, if you've ever used like a document scanner on your phone where you snap a picture or scan a document, it will automatically sort of resize the paper so it looks straight on your phone. And the way it does this is actually applying the opposite of the perspective transform to transform the view to be straight on your device. Here's a really simple example. Say I took a picture of a stop sign, and I computed the rectangle that bounds that uh, stop sign label. I can actually figure out the transform from that, apply the opposite, and that will straighten out the entire photograph because it's retransforming the image to feel correct. So for our case, we actually want to do the opposite. We want to take something 2D and apply a 3D transform to it on the z-axis to give it this sort of isometric perspective when it's transforming and moving. And it's really simple to do. M34 minus 1 over 500 is in the Apple documentation, and it works great. You can use it for tons of things. And it's really simple to set. Either you set the sublayer transform on a layer, which will automatically apply this perspective to everything below it, or you can set it on the layer itself. Both will behave in the same sort of way. And you can see the before and after here is like super stark, because on the left, it looks like it's just swooshing together and then opening back up, where on the right, it actually looks like it's flipping over and has some sort of depth to it. That's a delightful touch we're adding to our piece. We're giving some sort of physicality to it. But we also forgot one more thing, which is this concept of interruptible animations. Because when that's happening, the record's moving on screen, but you can't really touch anything. You have to wait till that finishes. And that's not really responsive. That feels like it's blocking your interaction. We have tap dismiss, but if something's moving on screen, you should be able to catch it and redirect it. In this case, we want interruptible gestures and animations to play really nicely with our transition. So if an album moves up to be presented, you should be able to grab it and throw it back down. And when you throw it while it's dismissing, you should be able to tap on it again to reopen it. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do this, so we're going to codify that. 
So in short, reducing time to interaction really is the thing that increases responsiveness. So again, in this transition, by us eliminating the animation blocking our touches, we are increasing time to reaction because the actual animation is reacting to our touches much quicker. So to do that, we're gonna apply some interruptible gesture recognizers. So in this case, we have a UI pan gesture recognizer, which is really common. And doing this sort of interruptibility is super simple when you set it up this way, especially with interruptible animations. So first, we're gonna grab the velocity and the translation. The velocity is how fast is your finger going, and the translation is how far did your finger go. Now when we begin, we're gonna tell the album starting position or whatever the animation is to just freeze in place and we're gonna save that. By stopping the animation, it will now lock on screen whatever it's at. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna reset the gesture recognizer. That will tell the gesture recognizer, hey, we're gonna start from this point. We want it to be relative from this point. Then anytime the gesture recognizer changes, we're gonna update the position of the album to always be relative to where the gesture started. So if it started up here, we're gonna add the translation value that happens from here as we move our finger relative to that point. And then once it finishes, we're gonna figure out, okay, was your intention for this to dismiss it? Or maybe it was to cancel it. Maybe you didn't drag it, drag it far enough to dismiss it and it's gonna go back in place. And you'll notice that if we just start this again, if you let go and you put your finger down again, we'll again freeze it in place, start the gesture from that point, move it relative to that point, and then start a new animation. This is what interruptibility brings to you when you develop this sort of loop. And you'll see that once we add this here, now it feels way more interactive. I can grab it at any point, I can pull it up. It's not gonna go anywhere because pulling up isn't gonna dismiss it, but if I throw it down, it's gonna follow my finger in velocity and it's always interactive. This is an app that feels super responsive all the time, which again, makes it feel a lot more delightful. And the contrast from before and after is just totally stark now at this point. The left looks sort of archaic. It looks really slow and really heavy. Where on the right side, you can flip through your albums real fast and edit settings as fast as you want, and it just feels a lot better to use. And the best part is this sort of animation actually applies even better when you have more screen real estate. Because in this case, we can add like a little buddy window that follows the, anim the album around as you're dragging around. And now not only is it fun to play with, but it's fundamentally showing you that the panel is actually coming from the underside of the record as it flips over, which is creating this sort of connection that the editor is now editing the record that you see, and when you throw it away, it collapses into itself. And doing this is so simple. You just have one spring follow another spring. Uh, so what we have here is we have the editor position animation, which is normal. We're just setting the position of the editor to whatever the spring is telling us to do. But anytime the album moves, we're starting a new animation for the editor to follow the album along. So what we're doing, again, we're gonna take the editor position and we're gonna set it relative to wherever the album is on screen. So we're gonna set it off to the side of it. And then what happens is as we start this animation, there's a delay that happens when the second spring ramps up. So it's always like it's pulling it along on some sort of string. And it's just really nice. And when you start applying this to Mac OS apps, you can start seeing like, oh, that's kind of fun. This actually feels really natural when you're using it, and it's just fun to play with. And it was so fun that I actually convinced uh, Antoine from Rocket Sim to add the same sort of tech to it. Uh, and it just feels so much better because it's like following you around. It's a little helper for you. And this is just really rewarding interaction. None of this really hinders the experience. It just amplifies it and makes it feel a lot more memorable. So some more pro tips. Drawing group and should rasterize are really helpful at improving animation timing. These will flatten either the Swift UI layers and rasterize them or CA layers so that it only has to raster an image and it'll then am animate the image of that. However, uh, you need to be really careful with this because if you start doing this everywhere, it's gonna cause your VRAM usage to go through the roof. But in this case of this animation, I do use it on the flip animation and it does make it a lot smoother as a result because it's again, not re-rendering anything during that transition. Also, just limit the amount of layout calls using translation on a transform or the position. And last but not least, in terms of showing like fade transitions for loading content from the network, these make your app immediately feel better overnight. And when you're reloading content that you have cached, don't show an animation for that. You don't need to. It's only when you wanna eliminate the sort of like flickering motion that just feels kind of busted. This is a much more delightful experience for doing that. So again, reduce heavy transitions wherever possible. Modals are lighter than navigation controllers. Sometimes they make a lot more sense to build. 
And when loading in remote content, fading animations just feel more responsive. Adopt interruptible gestures wherever possible. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but a lot of times it can make your app feel better. And really just try to reward interaction with animations that complement your gestures. That makes you feel connected to the application. All right, now we can work on making this app memorable. So we have a lot of building blocks to make this app feel great. We've built lots of tech over this talk so far. We have shared and consistent UI elements. We have performance scrolling. We have interruptible gestures and transitions. We have some really cool flips. But like, what else is it missing? Like, we really should be doing something with that album art that we spent so much time making performant. Like, if I say album art, like, what's the first thing that flows into your head when you think about it? I don't know, something never heard of it before. Uh, yeah, and so this is CoverFlow. Uh, it was removed uh, from iOS a very long time ago for some reason, but I actually spent a lot of time re-implementing that, and we're gonna do that together here as well. Uh, it's actually a lot easier to make than you think, since we've basically already built most of it. So what do we need for this? First, we need a bunch of album art views for each album in our library. Then we need some sort of coordinator or manager to handle the animation. Then we need interruptible animations. We need some math. We need an animation library. Seem familiar. Uh, and so we're not going to be using collection view for this, actually. Uh, this is the one factor that we need to really be really careful of, because if we're trying custom transforms to these sort of images, uh, collection view will try to just revoke them and remove them because it thinks they're off screen. It's actually working against us, and so you'll have albums that would just randomly disappear for some reason. So we're going to do all of this ourselves and mount all of that ourselves. However, I'm not going to share that in this talk. Uh, that's just general cell reuse. You can figure that out on your own. But what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the albums and position them in the middle of the screen. Because what we're going to work with is these albums, once they're in the middle, we're going to transform each individual album to be relative to all the other ones. So to do this sort of thing, what we're going to go through is start with a transform. And first, we're going to set the perspective transform on it. Then we're going to figure out the tilt amount, the spacing, and the percent rotated. The percent rotated is basically how much has this album moved past the point where we would want to change from left to right in terms of rotation. The spacing is just some random value that I messed with to make the math seem nice, so we're going to keep that as some constant. And the tilt amount is the percentage of how much you would want to tilt the record based on it being 90 degrees from the center point. So the X translation and the Z translation, these are again relative to the percent rotated. So as something comes across that middle point, we're gonna rotate it based on how far it's gone past that middle point. And the inverse, uh, if you're going the opposite direction. And the Z translation is we're gonna push albums back in the Z depth so it looks like they're moving behind each other. So they're not clipping into one another when you're scrolling through CoverFlow. Uh, special shout out to Nick Lockwood for iCarousel, which was super helpful and is probably the most accurate implementation of CoverFlow that I've found so far. So it was a great point of reference for at least working through a lot of this. So uh, we're gonna more, <clears throat> sorry. What we're gonna do is we're now break down each of these things from a more visual perspective so you can see how these are working together. So again, we started with putting all the records in the middle of the screen. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna move all of them based on one another. So based on the index that they're at in our collection, we're gonna shift them to the left or the right based on what index we've scrolled past. In this case, it's gonna be based on the album size, which is half. We want the records to be at half points from one another. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the Z translation to put stuff in the back. And when you look at this, you're like, wait, that doesn't really look all that different from here we had before. Nothing's really moving back. And that's because we forgot the perspective transform. We're gonna apply that perspective so that all of the albums that aren't in the middle, that aren't in the center focal point, are gonna move back behind it and leave that there. And last but not least, we're gonna apply these rotation angles to both the left and the right. And it's gonna be dynamic based on how far the middle record has moved to the left or the right. And when you put all of this together, looks sort of like this. Now, the last thing we're missing is scrolling. And it turns out that motion also has this as well. We can use a decay animation. And so a decay animation is just like a scroll view. It takes a velocity that starts, and it slowly decays it down until it stops. This is the velocity decaying, and it's where the name comes from. So again, setting up our animation is really simple. First, we're going to take a decay animation, we're gonna set the decay constant to be a UI scroll view constant of fast decay. We don't want a normal UI scroll view to just sort of like fly through all your records. We want it to slow down and stop real fast, which feels a lot better. 
Also, this is a really neat trick that you can use here, which is the rounding factor. So typically when you scroll, it'll sort of just like stop wherever it feels like it. But if you set a rounding factor, you can tell it to stop and gracefully stop before that point rounded to this particular value. So for example, in this case, let's say uh, we were scrolling on values of like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 for the focused album. In this case, it would always perfectly stop on that album. It's called Wheel of Fortune scrolling if you've heard of that before. On every value changed, we're gonna convert from the scroll view uh, coordinate space to the album's coordinate space. In this case, like I said before, we're scrolling based on indexes. So again, zero is the first one, 0.5 is halfway through the first one, one is the second one, and so on and so forth. And this is the math that we use to convert between the two. It's not that complicated. And so again, we're gonna play this same sort of interruptible gesture logic to it. So on the first start, we're gonna grab the velocity and the translation that we have. As the gesture recognizer begins, we're gonna tell the decay animation to stop where it currently is, so you're stopping with your finger. Then we're gonna save that starting scroll offset or scroll point. And then you're gonna take the pen gesture recognizer and again, reset it to be zero. Then as the decay animation changes, so as we're moving our finger along, we're gonna apply it relative to where we started. And as it ended, we're gonna tell the velocity or the gesture recognizer to take the velocity and apply that to the decay animation so it'll start from the speed that we swiped our finger. So it'll feel like it's handing off and then it'll slow down and stop. And again, this is a nice little loop that happens. It'll begin, it'll change, it'll end, and it'll slowly stop at its own point. And again, putting it all together, you get this really sort of nice cover flow effect where it'll scroll, all of them will dynamically transform against one another, and as you slowly move them, you'll see that they'll never really collide into one another. But you know, why stop there? We added cover flow, we can add some more cool stuff, right? What if we just made like the albums go poof, like when you delete them? Because that's kind of fun and it's really easy. Uh, you just set up a bunch of images, you apply it to an image layer and you run an animation. It's really simple. What if we added like shrink wrap to the records? Just like it would be like if you go buy it at the store, you have to unwrap it to use it. Like that's just really fun. Uh, you know, what if we created a custom retro album cover for when artwork was missing? Uh, if you remember this from like Netscape, now it looks like an album cover. What if we just remade the iTunes screensaver? Uh, sadly, we don't have time for that and I couldn't get it working, but it's a great idea. Uh, this is an even better idea. What if we gifted everyone a U2 album by default <laughs> and didn't let them remove it from the app? You know that? That's courage. <laughs> Anyways, so adding delightful experiences. What we did right there in that short burst of time was just go wild with adding fun things. These are things that people will remember. Smirk at, be happy to use, little surprises for people to find. None of them really hinder the experience. They're just additive. They're purely there to find. And really, once you get a stable foundation, you've improved the responsiveness and interactions, you can do this. You can do this as much as you want. This is the most fun part. These delightful details are what really set your application apart from everything else. And they're legitimately what bring joy to people using your app. Anything from a simple smirk to a really emphatic email. But just don't overdo it. You need to be judicious with these animations, transitions, and fun effects. And sometimes if you go too wild with them, you can actually make them inaccessible to people. You have to be really careful. You need to really account for people that don't want this sort of motion. Sometimes it's just too much for them. So respecting is reduced motion enabled is really good for doing this sort of thing. Switching to crossfade transitions, turning off animations altogether, they're much better for making your app feel accessible. But really, just embrace your passions. You know, people can sense when a lot of love and care goes into an application. It's the details that people find themselves getting attached to. It's what they talk about. The details are what make your app memorable. They're what people will remember and they're, make them feel like they're sharing the same passions as you. They're on the same sort of journey as you. I got this email after launching this app and I was just so happy because like, there was someone that spent the time to say like, hey, thank you. I am rediscovering albums that I haven't done on my phone before. And I think like, that's what the goal of this project really is, to make things that people wanna use. And really, just building delightful applications take a lot of time and effort. But really leaning into personal interests can really aid in making that feel like less of a chore. Making a product you think others will buy is one thing, but making something you really care about unlocks your ability to grow and learn exponentially. If you make something you enjoy, chances are that someone else will too. 
And really, the secret to building delightful applications is to pour yourself and your passions into them. Challenge yourself to elevate your apps from good apps to wonderful, delightful ones. You know, iOS has some of the best interaction and animation frameworks in the world. It's not even a contest. There is no reason not to try to do this, and I think it's just a really great thing to do. Grazie.